Good evening, everyone. I'm Pete Meyer, technical editor for Motor Age Magazine. Allow me to be the first to welcome you to tonight's webinar entitled Get Rags DCT 450 and 470 Transmission. Now, these are dual clutch manual transmissions that shift automatically, so they're kind of an interesting combination. Um, Going to be presented to you tonight by uh, ATSG's Wayne Colonna. He's also the publisher of Powertrain Pro, and as many of you know, that's now a regular part of Motor Age. You can see it every month in uh, the print issue and right here online uh, on the Powertrain Pro section of the website. So lots of great resources that Wayne and the folks at ATSG have provided for us here. And for those of you who have been followers of Wayne's for quite a while and are now you know, part of our family, let me welcome you especially because uh, a lot of the things that you guys are, are facing, uh, challenges in your own shops, the transmission specialty shops and so forth, we have a lot of information and resources that can help make that uh, life there a lot easier for you. So please take full advantage of it. Uh, before we get started with tonight's presentation, you'll notice that if you've been in some of Wayne's uh, webinars with us in the past, a little different format. We are hosting it right here at MotorAge.com. And a couple of ways that you can interact with us during the course of the webinar. If you look to the left of the video player, you'll see a Twitter feed. If you do have a Twitter account, if you do like to tweet, all you have to do is log in and join us there. It will automatically add the hashtag MATWebinars so that we can see your question in the feed. If you're using your own Twitter account, separate console, phone, whatever it is, make sure that you put that hashtag MATWebinars so that we'll see your question in the feed. If you want to be a little more traditional, right below the player is a comment section. Uh, you will have to sign in. But if you already have a Facebook or Google account or a Twitter account or whatever, you can use any of those to make the sign-in process very easy. If you just want to sign in as a guest, just uh, come up with the name and fill out, you know, file the instructions there. Very simple to, to get connected with the comment section. And we will do the best we can to answer those questions and address those comments uh, during the course of tonight's event. Very excited about the fact that we get to do it here now. Uh, some of the platforms that we used in the past were, uh, were kind of hindering. Uh, they, we had to be done within a certain amount of time because they were third-party applications. But you know, because of our success on YouTube, we're now able to use YouTube as our live streaming service. That's why you'll see the YouTube symbol in your player. And you'll also be able to see this later on right directly on our YouTube channel as well as being able to come back to this page anytime you want to review the contents of tonight's webinar. So, now that I've gotten all of that said and done, allow me to introduce good friend, uh, transmission guru as far as I'm concerned, been doing this a long time, Wayne Colonna. Wayne, how are you tonight? Doing very well, sir. Thank you so much. How good. are how you? How like that intro, bud? That was uh, <laughs> over the top. For <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, Wayne, I'm going to kind of sit here in the background. I'm going to go ahead and let you do your thing, and uh, I'll interject questions and comments as they are presented by our audience. Very good. Well, thank you. And, uh, well, I, too, would like to welcome uh, everyone to this evening's webinar where we will be taking a look at two double-wet clutch transmissions by GetRag. And I would first like to thank you again for joining us this evening. And of course, for our sponsors, Transstar and TransTech, in making this presentation possible. And I would also like to thank Automatic Choice in Europe for acquiring these transmissions and for Alto in shipping them here to the United States. So uh, thanks to them. And, uh, well, now before we get uh, into these transmissions, I would like to start with a little brief overall view of this type of transmission for the benefit of those who may be unfamiliar with them. You know, a double clutch transmission is um, an automatic manual gearbox that has oftentimes been referred to as a dual or twin clutch transmission, as well as a sequential automated manual gearbox. The dual clutch operation is quite ingenious where odd gears are being driven by one clutch and even gears by another through a double or split input shaft. <clears throat> now this style transmission may be new for many, but the concept was actually put down on paper as early as the 1930s and by the 1980s, Porsche 
and Audis use them in racing vehicles. And, and, and the reason why is the great advantage with this transmission is the speed in which the transmission can actually shift from one gear to the next. Now the, the two types of double clutch transmissions from GetRag here in the United States that we will be looking at is the DCT450 in Volvo and the DCT470 in Mitsubishi. Now outside of the United States, the DCT450 can be found in, in Dodge and Ford vehicles as well. Now both of these transmissions are controlled by a mechatronic unit which is an internal unit consisting of the valve body, solenoids, and a TCM. And what this tells us is that the external connector contains the power and ground circuits, network circuits, perhaps redundancy signals as well as gear select signals. Here, for example, <clears throat> are wiring circuits for the DCT450 on the left and, and the 70 on the right. The Volvo 450 gear select signal comes from the module directly into the TCM, while with the 70, the signal comes from the CPU over the network, but also has a redundancy signal hardwired into the TCM via an LIN, a local interconnect network line. So basically what I'm showing you here is that there's variation of inputs between make models. And another point I'd like to make here is that the, uh, the ETACS with Mitsubishi is a, it's an acronym for the Electronic Total Automobile Control System. And what it is, it's basically Mitsubishi's enhanced body control module handling a wide variety of electronic functions. And besides body electrical equipment control, it also handles gateway encoding functions. And, uh, and I will bring this module up again a little bit later, which is kind of why I wanted to point it out to you right here where you could actually see it in the wiring diagram, but we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later, an interesting aspect about it. But uh, here is a double input shaft assembly from the DCT450 in Volvo. The C1 clutch drives input shaft one, which in this transmission is a solid shaft with all the odd gears on it in the rear. Input shaft two handles the even gears being driven by the C2 clutch and is a hollow shaft sliding over the front side of input shaft one. Now, these two single line input shaft mesh with two separate out output shafts. And, and as you're looking at this, it, it may even answer a question you might have uh, in your mind, seeing that there's only one gear on input shaft two being used for both fourth and sixth gear. And that is because that single gear messes, meshes with output shaft one for fourth gear and output shaft two for sixth gear. Now here is output shaft one <clears throat> along with the shift forks and rails. And, and as you can see, this output shaft handles first, second, third, and fourth. Now in the blue and red square boxes, you will notice that each of these two gear shift forks shown has a magnetic pickup attached to them. These magnets are used to excite Hall effect sensors mounted on the backside of the TCM to be used as gear fork position inputs to this TCM. And if you look at the top of the slide, you can see that uh, the first and third gear assembly paired together is referred to as gear fork two while second and fourth is gear fork three. And, and the scan data will identify the gear shift forks in this way. So you would need to know that GF2 is for first and third position and GF3 is for second and fourth. And here we can see a similar arrangement with output shaft two. GF1 will monitor reverse and fifth, while GF4 will monitor sixth and park. But Really, the fork does not engage park. Uh, a typical parking pole and gear is used and is engaged and disengaged by the shift lever through cable and linkage, not the shift fork. It's really just a position reading indicating that the fork really is in a neutral position. Now, here are the two output shafts and fork assemblies as they stack up in the transmission. 
First and third and second and fourth are on output shaft one to the right. Fifth, reverse fifth and sixth on output shaft two to the left. And in between, in the background of the two output shafts, you can see the double single line input shaft. And so what we'll do is we'll spin this unit around so we can get a view showing how this input shaft one and two meshes with the output shafts. Now, try to visualize in your mind how only one input shaft can be turning for first gear while at the same time gear shift fork number three can also be engaged in second gear yet have no effect since input shaft two is not being driven. And also notice how the odd and even gears on the output shafts are directly across from each other. And obviously this is purposely designed but I will show you an interesting aspect to this in just a moment. But let's spin the transmission back around and, um, and having this visual aid in understanding the way the transmission shifts, when the vehicle is started, the computer assumes that drive will be the first selection made and will place gear shift fork two into first gear and gear shift fork three into second while you're still in park. Now, once the selector lever is moved from park to drive, the C1 clutch partially applies and will ramp on full as the brake pedal is released and the throttle is depressed. Now, if reverse is selected, there may be a slight delay as now it will need to move gear shift fork 2 to the neutral position before gear shift fork 1 can engage into reverse. Now, I pointed out just a moment ago about how the odd and even gears are directly across from one another and in part this was done to assist in gear blocking where both gear shift forks one and two are prevented from being engaged simultaneously. And built into this transmission are two gear blocker pins strategically located by the shift rails. As a fork is being engaged, it pushes a pin into a pocket on the opposite fork to hold it in the neutral position, called gear blocking. Now here is a view of, of these pins looking down showing how when either an odd or even gear is selected, the pairing odd or even gear assembly will be blocked from engagement by these pins. Now removing the shift levers for gear shift forks one and four, the two pins become visible. These two pins have different lengths and there's really no problem figuring out where they go. It's easy enough. The problem is forgetting to put them back in. <laughs> now, getting back to when we were in first gear, the C1 clutch is applied with gear shift fork two in first while gear shift fork three is in second in preparation for a one to two shift. Now once driving conditions are met to make that one to two shift, all that needs to take place is for the TCM to switch clutches. C1 comes off, C2 comes on. And as the vehicle increases in speed, there is a point where the computer will decide that a two to three shift will occur. In other words, it's kind of holding it where first gear is engaged, second gear is engaged, you're in second gear, and there could be a possibility where suddenly you're going to do a downshift in the first, and all they have to do is switch clutches. But at some point in time, the computer is going to decide it looks like we're going to be making a two, three shift, and we'll actually put it in third gear. The, the gear shift for two will go from first, to third while in second in preparation for that two three shift and that's what will happen here it will move gear shift fork one out of first into third and by being able to pre-select the gear and then switch clutches to make the shift shifting from one gear to the next is swift now the DCT 470 and Mitsubishi 
operates in a similar manner. The difference is the way the gearbox is configured. And although the 450 and the 470 look similar from the outside, once you split it, immediately you can see they are significantly different. Now, to make sense of this quickly, here is a cutaway view. We still have a double input shaft with the C1 clutch driving input shaft 1 for the odd gears and the C2 clutch driving input shaft 2 for the even gears. Now, if you were looking closely and and remembering what we saw with the DCT450, if you look closely where the input shaft enters the clutches, you will notice that the short hollow shaft is now input shaft 1, while the long solid shaft is input shaft 2. GetRag cleverly figured out a way to switch the C1 and C2 clutch so as to basically keep the same hydraulics and electronics as with the DCT450. In the 450, the clutch assembly closest to the engine is the C2 clutch, while with the 470, it is the C1 clutch. They accomplish this by switching the porting within the drum support itself. The hydraulics are the same from the valve body through the case and up into the support, but within the support itself, they redirected the pressure to be able to swap which clutch will be the C1 and which one will be the C2. And I'm so grateful that they configured the base of these supports completely different because you can, because you can imagine the problems we would have if these supports could be interchanged <laughs> accidentally. So now in this unit, the short hollow input shaft one drives a transfer gear, which turns a counter shaft, which then turns the odd gear output shaft. The, the odd output shaft contains first and reverse gears, while third and fifth are on the counter shaft. And if you look all the way at the top, all the even gears are on the uh, even output shaft as you can see at the top of the cutaway. So now when you split the case, one side contains both input shafts and output shaft two. Sometimes when you split the case, input shaft one will fall out on the bench, uh, like you could see here, but sometimes it, it will remain in on the other half of the case where all the other shafts and gears are located. In fact, if you look three quarters of the way down on the left is the location where the two input shafts pass through this part of the case. Now, in this side, I poked, in this slide, I poked the input shaft into that place because I wanted to show you how that input shaft one meshes with the transfer gear right under the cover there. Now that transfer gear then drives the counter shafts containing third and fifth gear, then the odd gear output shaft with first and reverse. As you can see, it's quite a departure from the way the 450 is laid out, and, and there are definitely a few more places in this setup where noises could develop. So it, it is helpful to understand the layout if you need to diagnose gear or bearing noise, but really detecting gear noise in this unit is difficult because with the transfer gear being in constant contact with input shaft one and the counter shaft, along with it driving the odd output shaft, in combination with having pre-selected gears, this gearbox is naturally noisy to begin with. So it's going to be taking some accustomed to getting to know what is normal noise and what is abnormal noise, and then to know where that abnormal noise might be coming from. Now, as with the 450, the 470 also has shift fork position sensors. Now shift fork position sensor one in this unit monitors first and reverse, 
while shift fork position sensor two monitors third and fifth here and the odd gear side of the case. Now on the even gear side of the case, sensor four monitors second and fourth, while sensor three uh, monitors sixth and neutral. Now this slide gives you an idea as to how the Hall effect sensors mounted on the back side of the TCM reaches into the gearbox up to these magnets. These signals can be monitored through a scan tool and is certainly helpful when we need to do some diagnostics. Now, courtesy of Autotech, here is a chart explaining fork position data that can be observed in a scan tool. And if we just look, for example, at the number one shift fork for first and reverse, um, a position of plus nine millimeters means that the fork is in first gear, while a negative nine millimeters means that it is in reverse. Zero millimeters means that the fork is in neutral. And, and you could see the same thing with gear shift fork two with third and fifth. You know, a, a plus uh, a minus nine millimeters means the fork is in second and third, plus nine millimeters means it's in fourth and fifth, and so on. Um, and the scan tool presents this information in a couple of ways. Here is a screenshot where the key is on, engine is off, while in park. This is key on, engine off, in park. It's a screenshot of a 2008 Mitsubishi Lancer Evo with a 2.0 liter. And, and this snapshot is showing current gear, which is in park. And since this is with the key on engine off, the transmission is in neutral because really it can't do any shifting with the engine off. There's no hydraulic pressure. Uh, but now, uh, so again, this is key on engine off. But now this screen here shows the gear fork positions in millimeters like the chart we just looked at. And since this transmission is in neutral, notice how all forks show zero millimeters. Hey Wayne, I'm going to yes. pause you just one second here to take care of a little housekeeping. Uh, guys, if you're watching and you're using the comment section to ask your comments or questions, you may have to refresh your browser and restart your player in order for it to show up on your page. Um, if you put in a comment and you post it, you see it posted on your page on your end, uh, rest assured that I'll see it on mine because I'm, I'm constantly updating that feed. But if you want to see everything that's going on in the comment section, uh, you may have to refresh your page and uh, restart the player uh, in order to see those updates. Or you can always use Twitter. Okay, we'll let you go back to it. Wayne, thanks. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, not a problem. Well, again, this, you know, this screenshot shows the gear fork positions in millimeters like the chart we looked at. And, and because it's in neutral, we're seeing zero millimeters. And, this neutral position in park, it, it's, this is very important to know this uh, about, uh, particularly with Mitsubishi, um, uh, but this neutral position in park actually occurs when the engine is turned off. And this is, poor, is important to know because there is a delay of a couple or few seconds before the engine will shut off after you turn the ignition switch off. And the reason why the engine keeps running for two or three more seconds after you turn the ignition off is it gives the TCM some time to shift all the pre-selected shift rails into neutral. And this is normal operation. This is not a pre-ignition problem. And the reason for this is if pre-selected gears remained engaged, the added resistance could lead to a hard start problem. So having the transmission in neutral provides for a much smoother startup. And, and I wanted to bring back to your, to your remembrance when I was looking at, when we were looking at the wiring diagram, how I pointed out the ETACS, the, um, the body computer. It is that computer that keeps the engine running after the ignition is shut off. It's one of the jobs that that body computer has actually. And, um, and one other thing to know is that even the, during that two or three second time that that engine is still running, if you get into the throttle, the throttle will respond. So um, that's normal. And, uh, and obviously, you don't want to get into the throttle. You don't want to do any shifting or playing around 
during that two or three second period of time as it's trying to put that transmission into neutral. Now, as soon as you start the vehicle, the computer, as I told you earlier when we were looking at the, the, all the gears in the fork, will anticipate a shift into drive, so it will engage both first gear and second gear and obviously nothing's moving because the C1 and C2 clutches are off while we're in park. Now looking at this in millimeters, it's interesting because we can see the fork position screen confirms the engagement. Shift fork number one is at plus nine millimeters, which means it's in first, while shift fork four is at a negative nine millimeters, meaning that it's in second gear. Now once drive is selected, the TCM will ramp the C1 clutch on. Now here is reverse and what's interesting here is that you can see that second gear remains pre-selected because in reverse we're going to be using the C1 clutch. The C2 clutch is what drives uh, second and we can keep that off so we can keep second gear remained. Now this screen shows how the shift fork one went from plus nine millimeters to for, from being in first gear to the negative nine millimeters for reverse, while shift fork four stayed at nine millimeters for that pre-selected second gear. Now, I, I would like to point out just a couple of things here that would be very good to know because there's really nothing worse than trying to fix something that isn't broken. Um, first thing is that obviously due to the complex nature of the transmissions, you know, the owners of the vehicle may experience a longer gear engagement into drive or reverse uh, from the park position than what they might initially expect. And this is a normal characteristic of the transmission. Sometimes, and this is crazy, but it's true, sometimes owners may even select reverse and it doesn't engage. And an MIL light may begin to flash indicating an unsuccessful shift due to gear blocking. And But if the transmission is placed into drive, and it engages, and then the selector lever is placed back into reverse, it engages, this too is normal. So every now and again, you could have a no reverse engagement because of gear blocking uh, issues. And so you just put it in drive, it engages, put it back in reverse, everything's happy. Now recently I did a seminar in Australia where a gentleman was telling me how this issue becomes more frequent as the transmission fluid degrades. And uh, if you give it a fresh fill, this issue becomes less frequent. And secondly, uh, you know, in cold weather conditions, and I'm talking cold, like minus 20 degrees Celsius, uh, uh, minus 4 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, engine speed becomes restricted because it, um, it will prevent clutch drag. You know, the fluid's going to be a thicker, the clutches could drag, and since we put it, uh, the, the computer puts it in pre-selected gears, it could try to move the vehicle and uh, especially like when you're in park and you're starting it up, um, it could try to move the vehicle and, and that could be an issue. So for a while there, engine speed will be restricted. Now when it comes to removing the double wet clutch drum assembly, fork position data is going to be needed as it is best to remove the clutch drum assembly while all four forks are in the neutral position. Now inside this clutch drum assembly there is a spanner nut sitting inside the C1 and C2 clutch drive hubs that spline onto the input shaft. These hubs have also been referred to as clutch baskets due to their appearance. Now this is the drum support we saw earlier and, and we're seeing it now bolted on to the front of the transmission that the drum assembly slides onto. Now the spanner nut inside the clutch drum assembly screws into this support and will need to be unscrewed to remove the drum assembly. Now if you remember when you shut the vehicle off the engine continues to run until the TCM has a chance to put all the shift rails into park. Now if you just turn the key on keeping the engine off, the TCM will not be able to shift the fork since there is no hydraulic pressure at this time. 
And if the transmission was placed into neutral, all your shift forks should show at zero millimeters. Now, you could be having a problem with the transmission and, and uh, uh, you know, you might have mechanical issues. And so now the computer can't put the forks into neutral. So if this happened, you're going to have to get the unit on the bench and you will need to pull these shift rail detent balls out and then look through the holes to see if the rails are in the neutral position or not. And if they're not, you will need to manually place the rails into the neutral position. Now, in front of both the 450 and 470, there is a sealed cover which will need to be removed. This sealed cover is, is at times referred to as a sacrificial cover because it usually will get distorted when you are prying it out. But once the cover is off, you now have access to this double clutch drum assembly. Uh, just one note on the uh, DCT450, however, there is an access port on the top of the case. And by unscrewing this plastic plug, you could blow air into this opening to pop the cover and maybe save it and be able to reuse it instead of having to buy another one. Now, you may have noticed that there's a difference in the configuration at this center of the clutch drum between the 450 on the left and the 470 on the right. The DCT450 has a spring which needs to be aligned with the crankshaft. Special tools are required to hold the crankshaft in proper position while pulling the unit into the crank. Now I found these tool part numbers from spxtools.com uh, under a 2006 Ford Galaxy, because remember this unit is overseas in a Ford, and uh, yes, for you guys here in the United States, I said Ford Galaxy. Well, overseas they still have them, but as you can see, they've come a long way since the uh, C4 transmission days. Now, <clears throat> the spring in the double clutch housing interfaces with a dog clutch bolted to the flywheel. The dog clutch or claw clutch interface is designed so that it can absorb small vibrations or movements between the engine and transmission. But getting back now to removing the double clutch drum, both the 450 and 470 have four rubber plugs to be removed, which cover the access ports to align the clutch hub slots to reach the spanner nut with a special tool. A pick can be used to align these slots, as the picture to the right illustrates. And um, now this is the special tool for the 450. It has four pins that reach into the clutch drum through the four access ports in the center area but it also attaches itself to the assembly through um, outer perimeter slots that are provided by the manufacturer. This tool then acts as a handle to be used to unscrew the drum assembly from the support and to be able to lift the drum from the transmission and set it down. An initial slight braking turn to the right, followed by approximately eight to nine turns to the left, unscrews the nut, um, freeing the drum from the support. Now, <clears throat> it really is not a good idea uh, to set the drum down, as you see in the bottom picture, for any great lengths of time. And the reason for that is the metal structure of the drum housing can flex under the weight of the assembly, and it may not recover, and it, uh, it will then have uh, an interference with the clutch clearance. So it can, it can damage the assembly. Um, now, the 470 requires a different tool since the center area is not using a dog clutch like the 450 does. The tool you see here was fabricated, fa it was fabricated by the machinist at, Al at the Alto plant in Alabama where I took these transmissions apart along with Robbie Ferguson. But we do have the uh, Mitsubishi part numbers listed for you if you like to have it down below. Now this tool works with a ratchet to unscrew and tighten the spanner nut and um, on the bottom right of the screen you can see torque specification Mitsubishi provides when installing the drum assembly 
and I have not seen a specification with the 450. So it's it's interesting to see that it is with Mitsubishi. Um, but you will also notice this tool is not designed to lift the drum out of the transmission like the one that, that's being used for the 450. And for this, we recommend modifying pipe hangers, which will do a much safer job at lifting and removing the drum assembly than snap ring pliers. Now, once the drum is removed, be sure to locate and secure the needle bearing that could easily fall away unnoticed um, and give you big problems later by putting the drum assembly back in without it. So it, it can fall away if you're not aware that it's in there. Now, there are two snap rings that hold the assembly together externally. There are snap rings inside too, but externally to take the drum apart, there are two snap rings that hold this assembly together. Now I need to point out that this assembly really is not designed to be disassembled. The manufacturer would much prefer that you buy a complete new assembly for over $2,000. Uh, but now the snap ring to the right is swallowed by the pump drive gear that is integral to the housing. Now if you're careful, and I mean careful, there is enough flexibility in the cover to depress it low enough to free the snap ring without damaging any parts. Now the snap ring to the right is a little tougher to remove, but it can be done in a similar fashion. Now we've noticed that this snap ring is selective, so we assume that it's used to adjust clutch clearance internally. So if you have several drums and you're trying to make one out of two, be careful here. And we also recommend that you mark all of your parts um, so that you can reassemble them in the same position to prevent any possibility of vibrations uh, due to imbalance. Now, once you get the drums apart, you have typical clutch plates, both fiber and steels. You have O-rings and molded pistons. And the good news here is these parts have been made available for some time now. In fact, TransTech just sent out a news release as well. So this is a rebuildable unit. Now, one critical point during the assembly of this uh, double clutch drum is that the frictions are directional as seen in this slide. The direction shown here is a view from the engine side looking to the drum assembly. If the frictions are installed incorrectly, this will affect the apply and release of the clutch, especially since we're going C1 clutch to C2 clutch to C1 clutch to C2 clutch. So it's critical that these frictions are, are put in properly. Now, after the drum is assembled, it will need to be prepared to be installed into the transmission by centering the spanner nut. You can make a tool to do this using PVC pipes and couplings, an idea brought forth by Autotech. Uh, once the nut is centered, you need to have the transmission positioned so that you can bring the drum down over the support going north to south, if you will. If you try to put the drum going east to west, the gravity will drop that nut and you will have a bear of a time trying to get that nut to start. Now also keep in mind that as you bring the drum down onto the drum support, you have to be sure to get the pump drive gear to mesh properly with the driven gear on the pump shaft before you're actually going to be able to get that nut to start. Now, once the drum is in and the spanner nut is tightened, the seal cover will need to be installed. And Mitsubishi has a tool to help guide the cover down around the outside. You can also use a solo three ounce bath cup for the center instead of purchasing the tool that they have for it. And there's tools also for the 450 to do the same. Now, after installing a new clutch housing assembly or putting in a rebuilt clutch housing assembly, 
the TCM must have its learned values reset before it will perform properly. And really at this time, the factory scan tool must be used to perform this procedure. Um, <clears throat> now there are four processes that make up clutch teaching. And uh, of course the transmission um, must be at operating temperature and uh, you, you, you're going to need to, to uh, follow the proper sequence and you could look at bulletin 13-22-001-002. This will help you. But the, uh, the four processes that make up the clutch teaching procedure is the clutch ventilation, stroke teaching, boost teaching, and reset gain. Now, I've been told by a reliable source that the manufacturer scan tool can be rented for a two-week period for $150 to do the job. However, <laughs> they're going to want a $4,000 deposit. Um, so you can get it for two weeks for $150, $4,000 deposit, uh, but, but then you're going to have to have access to the manufacturer's website to be able to download programming files, and that cost is going to be about $19.95 per day. So did you say so something? I'm, I'm sorry, I had to chuckle at that four thousand dollar deposit there, Wayne. But, <laughs> well, but yeah. I, well, you know, I'll guarantee you, you'll remember to bring the tool sure. back. <laughs> I, I, I do want to ask a quick question, though, uh, for for a drivability guy. Teaching that's a new term for me. Can you explain what does that what does that mean? Teach in. Teach in to teach in. Yes, sir. That, that, that was what. Well, it's obviously because the, 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 the clutches are, are being applied and released, applied and released, there's great timing involved to do this because even though, even though the, the gear shifts are pre-selected, the gears are pre-selected, you still have to release one clutch and apply another, and so there's going to have to be a shift overlap. And, and what's also interesting is both of these clutch pistons are having a constant amount of a preload pressure in them. They don't really go to zero pressure. So, so there's a lot of being able to know how the clutch is going to apply and release, and and to be. I mean, you you just can't put the clutch on once you put it in gear. You'll stall the engine. So you got to know how to creep the clutch on. You got to know how how the clutch is going to come off and how we can shift into the next clutch. So all of these different procedures all amount to just knowing how the clutch is going to apply and release and to control it as precisely as possible. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, so now continuing, um, uh, an alternative, now here's an alternative now, if you don't have $4,000 and and uh, and you don't want to spend the $150 for a two week period of time, you can use a J2534 pass through um, that is used for OBD2 emissions and reflashings of PCMs. Most people know about this. The files for the TCM programming are available to download from the manufacturer's website. So in this case, you would have to spend $20 a day. Um, the same thing goes for when, um, um, uh, when you have to put a new mechatronic unit in. Um, you will need to pull data from the original TCM to put it into the new TCM. Similarly, Special procedures must be performed when a new transmission is installed. Now, this might not happen for too many people because Mitsubishi charges around $14,000 for a new transmission. But now, one thing that's interesting is that there was an incident that, that occurred in Canada where a shop used a bootleg program for some reason to turn the tire monitoring light off permanently with a Mitsubishi vehicle. And when they were all done, the vehicle would no longer move. And if I remember correctly, it affected the ETACS, the body computer, where it no longer allowed the engine to run long enough to place the transmission into neutral before shutting the engine off. So once the ignition was turned on, it racked up a pile of codes because it saw that it wasn't in neutral, and it took programming several modules to correct this condition. Now another unique aspect to this transmission 
is that due to internal case configuration, there needs to be more than one drain plug to adequately drain the transmission. It's partitioned on the inside, and as you can see, there's three drain plugs here. Um, the one all the way to the left is in the diff area. The one to the right bottom, if you will, is uh, the main case, and the one right above it is uh, right where the dual clutch assembly is. Now, later Mitsubishi's, um, the mod around 2010, uh, what I've been told is, is they eliminated the drain plug under the double clutch drum area as well as the uh, the line pressure tap. Now, BOT341 is the fluid used in this transmission. Mitsubishi refers to this as the Aqueen SSTF. The, uh, the fill plug is on top by the range selector lever. The check plug is located on the differential part of the case by the left axle. Now, to remove this plug may take a little ingenuity in modifying an Allen wrench as framework may be restricting access to this plug. So you might have to look at it and make your own special tools to get that plug out of there to check level. Now this unit has an external filter with, which can be serviced. Now there is an internal filter as well and there was a time when you could not purchase this filter. But this now has been made available by an aftermarket source. But of course to change this filter would require transmission removal and disassembly. Now you may notice that with the external filter removed, there are three ports going to it. Now this is due to a thermal bypass strategy where fluid is prevented from circulating through the heat exchanger until it reaches about 167 degrees Fahrenheit and is in full circulation at about 176 degrees Fahrenheit. The three port design uh, is, is the, the three port design is to allow the fluid to be able to circulate through this filter whether or not this oil is going to a heat exchanger or not. Now the thermal bypass valve controlling this operation is in the valve body and is in the same lineup as the pressure cut safety valve. Now this will allow the pressure cut safety valve, uh, this, this will allow the, the pressures actually to be cut from the clutches as a safety precaution should extremely high temperatures occur. The uh, Mitsubishi DCT470 transmission has had their fair share of issues and one of them being what you see right here, a contamination of the fluid turning into a paste-like substance, clogging the filters, and a buildup of ferrous metal on the fork magnets, and yet no internal damage could be located. So fluid samples were sent out examining both virgin fluid and contaminated fluid to determine in part what was causing the paste-like substance in the fluid. What was discovered is with the virgin fluid, there was one part per million of iron, whereas with the contaminated fluid, there was 1,146 parts per million. Now this appears to indicate, since there was no internal damage could be found, that the gears inside this transmission may not have been properly dressed where there was flashing still on the edge of the gear. So in time, uh, the contamin it would contaminate the fluid as these iron particles fell away from the gear teeth edge. And, and that's just an assumption. We're really not sure where it's coming from. The result, obviously, the variety of codes and possibly a no-move condition. And without being able to purchase an internal filter at one point, another transmission would need to be acquired. And as I said, would go for $14,000. But as I mentioned earlier, there is now an aftermarket source for these filters. Now another issue that has been seen clogging filters is the yellow plastic torsion spring retainers 
inside the double clutch drum, they're breaking apart into pieces and getting into the filter. The pistons used to move the shift forks in and out of gear, as you can see, there's eight of them. They are also known to wear down and in time cause shift issues. The positive and negative legs of the coil in each of the solenoids are designed to have a tension contact to the TCM when the TCM is bolted down to the valve body. Care needs to be taken during repairs or rebuild to not bend or distort these solenoid contact or coil leg where it can lose the press fit it needs, otherwise unnecessary solenoid faults will occur. Now there are a total of nine solenoids on this valve body, but not all nine solenoids are the same. There are three different style solenoids, but all of them measure approximately three ohms each. Uh, at this time, they cannot be purchased separately. If you need solenoids, you either have to have a good use solenoid somewhere, or you may have to buy the entire mechatronic assembly which sells for around $2,400. The valve body is pretty simple, not much to it, just a few valves, a few small parts. There is a difference, uh, and it's a subtle one, between the 450 and the 470 in the odd even control valve area on just one side of the valve body. And here you can see on the casting for the 450, it's closed off in this odd even control valve area while the 470 has an exhaust port. Now on the fluid passage side of this valve body, what we can see here is that oil pressure from the clutch cooling flow solenoid is allowed to influence the odd even control valve whereas the 470 this passage is blocked and an exhaust passage was put in, in its place behind the valve. Now here is a full hydraulic schematic of the 450 transmission, just so that we can point out the solenoid, which is used in part to influence this odd even control valve. And, uh, and of course that we saw where the passage was able to reach that valve, whereas with the 450 it was blocked from going there. Now here is a close up showing the difference. To the left, you can see where the green oil is coming in from the solenoid, able to influence the end of the valve, whereas with the DCT-470 on the right, the spacer plate covers that passage. Uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, the uh, exhaust is on the back side where they added it, uh, and the spacer plate covers the passage going into it. So why they made such a subtle change to this, I really don't know, so I'm not going to hazard a guess. but. But this is the only difference I can see between the 450 and the 470 valve bodies. Um, there are very few small parts in this valve body. The line relief valve, if you look in the upper right corner, you'll see where it's pointing to the line relief valve, the lube relief valve right below it, and then right near in the center of the valve body, you'll see that there is a solenoid screen. Um, these parts have been eliminated uh, with Mitsubishi on their later models. They eliminated the, uh, the screen. Um, they eliminated those uh, relief valves. And, um, and in fact, if you look at where the screen slot location is, right above it is where you'll be able to identify the difference between the 450 and the 470 valve body. There the arrow is pointing to where that passage is blocked going to that odd even control valve. On the 450, that passage will continue on to the valve. But that close up helps you to get to see a little better where that change took place. Now, to remove and install a 450 valve body is a bit more involved than a 470 as there is a transmission range sensor involved. Now, besides removing the bolts that attaches the mechatronic assembly to the case, a long bolt from the top of the case also needs to be removed to free the transmission range sensor. Now, once, once you do that, you have to get the clutch drum speed sensor, which also acts as an engine RPM sensor, will need to be unplugged and the wires moved out of harm's way, and then the entire mechatronic assembly can be easily removed. Now, the lever 
for park, reverse, neutral, and drive does not move a manual valve. There is no manual valve in this transmission. All it does here in the 450 is to partially rotate a magnetic wheel which the TCM reads to know what gear range was selected. This transmission range sensor wheel can obviously rotate 360 degrees, but it can only go in one way. Now, to install the mechatronic unit back into drive with the range sensor wheel properly located, a sensor gauge or a 120 thousandths pin can be used to align and hold the wheel in place to the housing. There is a hole in the wheel that you rotate until it aligns with the hole in the housing. Drop the pin in, then place the transmission selector lever into the drive position and install the mechatronic unit and, and range sensor bolt. Then pull the alignment pin out and look to see if the range sensor wheel hole remained aligned with the housing. If the hole is off, like we're showing an example of that in the bottom right corner of your screen, if the hole is off, you got to keep repeating that process until you have it right. This is how Volvo illustrates this process um, with their sensor setting gauge part number 999-7426. Now, Mitsubishi instructs you to place the lever into a position one notch past D. And I am really not sure why they're asking you to do this because there is nothing inside that transmission that's moving um, that requires you to do this. Um, uh, the transmission range sensor is actually in the console shifter. Um, so why they're asking you to move that selector lever one notch past D, I I'm really not sure, but they do. And um, anyway, uh, and in light of this shifter here, um, there has been some complaints about harsh shifting with Evos in the sport and super sport mode. And, and Mitsubishi states that when in sport or super sport modes, the transmission shifts quicker than in normal mode and upshifts occur at a higher RPM. And this can cause a shock when shift occurs. And this shock has been purposely calibrated into the system to provide a shift feedback to the driver. And so this is considered normal operation. Well, that's it for this evening's presentation. Powertrain Pro proudly supports mom and pop shops of all kinds across America, sponsored by companies who care. And I just want to thank you for your time. Well, thanks a lot there, Wayne. Appreciate, of course, you're taking your time to share your experience and expertise with us. Uh, very good presentation. Uh, looks like you've done such a great job. Had very few actual technical questions come across, just a few uh, housekeeping issues. Guys, if you do have any questions, now's the time to ask them. Uh, use the comment section there at the bottom of the page or tweet us using the tweeter up at the top left there. Um, as Wayne said, I want to thank uh, the folks at TransTech and TransTar for helping make this, this free training opportunity available to you. And I encourage you, if you are not a subscriber to Motor Rage, uh, to do so. Uh, go up to the very top of the page and hit that subscription link. If you're a qualified shop, you get it for free. And if you're not, hey, it's not that, it's not that expensive. <laughs> so join in with us there and, and learn about all the different training opportunities that we have available for you. Uh, one more thing, too. If on the player, you're going to see the, uh, up at the top right corner, you're going to see the cover of our latest issue. If you click on that, that is our subscription link to our YouTube channel. Uh, of course, all the video that we do, all the online presentations that we make are hosted there, as well as right here on the AutoPro Workshop at ModeRage.com. Okay, we have a comment up here. Said, so, uh, "Yes, Lee, we are live to ask questions. Uh, so, do you have one for us?" <laughs> there we go. Takes a while to, to point. Brian has a question. More to come. You bet there is. Uh, if you subscribe to the newsletters, uh, you will be advised of when 
these webinars are going to be hosted. Our next one is going to be November 21st, I believe, uh, as I travel once again up to Mayo Pack, New York, to talk about electrical testing techniques for the folks up there at TST. Now, that's a little bit different. Uh, we actually do the uh, technical side in a shop, on a car, uh, right there live. And, of course, being live, things happen. You know, but uh, please join in with us. Uh, we'd love to have you come. Again, again, it's just another one of those free training opportunities that we try to provide for our readers. Uh, I mean, both Wayne has done his, his time under the hood and under the car, and, of course, I, I spent a lot of years, you know, doing this type of work. Uh, we both understand what it takes to make a living in this business, don't we, Wayne? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, yeah, we've all got a lot of time into it. So that's the goal here. That's one of the reasons that... that, that Wayne joined, you know, the Motor H family, and we were so excited to get him here, uh, is to help just make that much more of a package, you know, for for you guys and gals, who are still out there in the trenches. You know, we know what it takes, and if there's any way that we can help make that job a little easier, uh, make life a little more efficient, help you put a little more money in your pocket at the end of the day, well, that's that's the whole goal. All right, so I'm going to leave it open for just a few more minutes here. If we have questions, we'll take them. Um, no, Lee, no, Mike, buddy, just uh, write in your question in the comment section. That is an interesting concept, though. We have a few things that we've been doing here with this uh, new Google Hangout. Um, makes it live, allows some folks to participate. So, hey, stay with us. Uh, I think if you're... Uh, been with us for any length of time. If you've been to more than one of these events, you know that, that of all the folks out there that are in our business, uh, we're the ones bringing this to you. Uh, nobody else is. We're trying to push that, that envelope a little further uh, every day so that we can provide as many resources as we can you know, for you guys. All right, well, things are looking quiet on the board. Uh, if you do have a question afterwards, it's very easy to find us uh, to to get in contact with us. Uh, you can look for us on Facebook. You can look for us on Google+. You can look for us on Twitter. You know, we're, we are not hard to find on any of the social networks. Every issue of the print magazine has our email contact information, as you can find it here as well. If you go to the AutoPro Workshop, it's that community tab up there at the top of the page here. Uh, and you can write us directly. We will respond to you. Okay, we are getting a few little bit here. Can we download this information, Stephen? Yes, I guess if you, you can, if you go to YouTube after we're all done, uh, you can use any one of the several free YouTube downloaders that are out there on the market to, uh, to save the file to your desktop if you wish. Uh, however, I will caution you, this is uh, copyrighted material, so you can't use it for your personal gain or to host it on your own website as your own material. Uh, let's see, who else we got here? Um, Brian, you're more than welcome. Uh, and for all those who came, I thank you, because if it wasn't for all of you coming out, you know, we wouldn't need to be here, and, and we do not mind spending our time. I know Wayne uh, is certainly, you know, behind you know, the folks working out there in the field. And uh, Lee, again, if you have a question later on, like I said, it's not hard to find us. Um, you can contact Wayne or any one of his technical assistants, uh, through ATSG. In fact, Wayne, I'll give you a little opportunity here uh, for folks who are interested in more of the ATSG services, if you want to share that with them. Or if there is a transmission problem, what that problem may be. And so we have uh, annual subscriptions um, where they could have the full tech support um, and they can call as many times as they need to. Uh, but we also have a pay per call. Uh, it's $30 and um, that allows a person to call in with one specific problem and we will stay with that one problem for however long it takes till it's resolved for that $30. Of course, if all of a sudden another problem comes up, well, that's another $30. So it's a per incident fee, but you know that for that one problem, it's only going to cost you $30.
Otherwise, um, for the whole year package, it's $650, and that allows you to have online access to where all our bulletins are on the membership side. It also allows you to offer a uh, nationwide warranty uh, where you could deal with um, any, any failed units with another ATSG subscribing shop and work out the problem of getting that unit back on the road. Um, and, of course, you have access to the technical hotline as many times as you need it. Um, and, uh, and, and we're open um, uh, just uh, 8 to 4.30 East Coast time. But if we see that the West Coast increases, um, we will do a, a time shift to handle West Coast as well. Yeah, I, yeah. and, you know, guys, you got to take into account, too, the lot of material that you saw in this presentation you know, like that hydraulic diagram, for example, is something that Wayne actually created himself. I mean, this, this, these guys don't fool around. I've been to their shop. Uh, they know transmissions inside and out. Of course, Wayne teaches all over the world. He's a highly respected uh, trainer, and, and, and uh, of course, the service has been around quite some time. Uh, we do have a couple of more comments here, Wayne, for you. Uh, let's say Paul. Uh, never No such thing as a dumb question, Paul. It says the shifter set up like an automatic or a manual as far as the designation, but is there a clutch pedal? And that's what's kind of the neat things about these transmissions, isn't it? Yeah, and I guess the main reason for this design, Paul, is that the, the manual transmissions are more efficient than the automatics, right? And... Can I see if I can get this one clear for you um, from, uh, I guess, Estelle Sutton? Yeah. He said to take the detents out and physically put the forks in neutral. What if the units damage to the point that you can't do that? Um, fingers that actually reach in there to grab that um, is actually quite um, flimsy <laughs> so they can actually break um, uh, so if you had something sturdy uh, to get onto that spanner nut um, then you'll be able the idea is just to be able to break that nut free without having a whole lot of resistance involved and uh, and that's why the neutral position is, is is asked for but if you can get something sturdy in there to get that nut loose um, you're on your way. Okay, well, I think that's just going to about do what? There's another one popped up. We're just, we're just going to keep right on going here. Okay, no, couldn't hear the other gentleman. Um, all right, let's try that again. Okay, that'd be my bad, Paul. Uh, you were talking about the automatic transmission. Let me, he's, he's back up online now, so let's go back to that question for Paul's benefit. Uh, hey, that's the neat thing about doing these things live, okay? <laughs> Keeping everything yeah. in place. Uh, but that was a question we were talking about um, with Paul of how uh, these are manual transmissions and, and how they operate, but they are controlled electronically and they have no clutch. Uh, and that's one of the beauty parts of it. The, uh, the manual transmission is very efficient. Um, but a lot of people don't like to drive the traditional manual. They don't, like me, I don't like dealing with the clutch pedal. Uh, so this gets the benefits of the manual tranny, but with electronic control, it gets the shifting quality, almost the seamless shifting of, a, uh, of an automatic. That's right. That's right. And, 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 you know, obviously, you could try to drive it where you're going to see a delayed response um, you know, if you're trying to do a specific downshift um, or, or you're really forcing it to try to make the transmission respond in an unusual way, there will be delayed responses, you know. But on normal driving conditions, you know, once you put that thing in drive and you take off, I mean, that thing is going to shift one, two, three, four, five, just beautifully, all the way up in the sixth gear, 
very quickly. Uh, it's just a nice shifting unit. But um, there, are, there is some, um, you can force some hesitation in the shifting if, if it has to do a maneuver that requires, um, as we saw, gear blocking is involved. So you, it would have to require a step down to get it into a gear um, low enough, and there might be um, there might be a delay in that happening. And and Paul, I guess you ask if this is the way of the future. There's no question in my mind that that's exactly what it is. I mean, we're looking at that, that uh, six speeds here, uh, but that's not the limit. I mean, we've got some units out now. If if correct me if I'm wrong there, but uh, Wayne, but uh, we're looking at uh, eight, ten, even more gears in in some of these trains. Yes, exactly. You know, they said that ten speed was going to be the max. Well. Uh, I just heard that they're even thinking 12 speeds, and, and they're already into 12 speeds now. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's crazy. But um, the whole idea, obviously, with that anyway, is to try to keep engine RPM within a certain parameter. Sure. Um, sure. So, you know, that's really the idea behind it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, again, we're looking at, at meeting uh, federal standards for fuel economy of, what, like 52 miles per gallon, I think, corporate average fuel economy numbers. Uh, and not in the not too distant future, and uh, of course, if you're uh, on the drivability side, like I've been, you've seen tremendous changes on on the power plant side, um, and now you're seeing the same things on the transmission side. It's, it's all it's got to be, um, it's got to be a package deal. I mean, it, the whole car now is being tuned, you know, to meet that emissions and, and efficiency requirements that uh, that we're putting on it. Well, guys, I tell you what, uh, I think I'm going to tie up Wayne long enough here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and cut him loose, and uh, I'm going to say uh, for Wayne Colonna uh, and me, Pete Meyer, Motor Rage Magazine and Powertrain Pro, thank you so much for uh, being with us here tonight, and uh, stay tuned. We will be looking forward to seeing you again. Have a great evening.